Okay, where to get started? Alright, so since this week is Nintendo, I guess we could probably start by talking about, like, our introduction to Nintendo, if we had any. Very young for me. My first introduction to Nintendo was... It was probably one of my earliest memories of me being at my cousin's house in San Bernardino and watching him play Duck Hunt on the SNES. But the first time I've ever played Nintendo games was also at my cousin's house where he got the N64 for the first time and we messed around on Super Mario 64 a lot. I found Mario burning his ass on lava hilarious. <laughs> and annoying when I when it happened to me. Uh, I would say my first experience with Nintendo is definitely through Zelda, and that's why I I have like such a love for the Zelda franchise. Which Zelda? I actually think uh, I actually think it was one of the handheld titles. Uh, could be wrong, but definitely uh, Wind Waker. Uh, my my first main Zelda game was Wind Waker. So the hand title was uh, The Minish Cap. I love that game to death, honestly. I'm going to draw my uh, my favorite uh, tomboy waifu. Is it the female trainer from Pokemon? Uh, no, I was going to draw Daisy. <laughs> Daisy seems awfully feminine for a tomboy. I don't know, everybody draws her as a tomboy, so it's just like... They also draw her browner lately. Yeah, I'm yeah. Not, I'm not, I'm I'm not opposed that. to it, mind you. Yes. It's some nice, uh, variety. Dark-skinned tomboy waifu. <laughs> Speaking of Mario, okay, so... I am kind of ashamed to admit this, but there was a point... when I actually used to watch Game Theory. <laughs> yeah. It's okay, Brad, nobody's perfect. Womp womp. To be fair, to be fair, I think... In my defense, I think this was before MatPat went off, off the deep end. Was this before he gave the Pope Undertale? <laughs> oh god! By the time he dropped that episode, I had long stopped watching. Okay. That's but so- I that's, I'm sorry, that's so <laughs> cringe. That, that's the most autistic- That is the- what? No, it's just- The sheer- mm. It's the- Just the concept. It's not autistic, it's just lame. Okay, no, I'm sorry. That's okay. Speaking as someone uh, who's on the spec, who's like on the spectrum, uh, that's the most autistic thing I have ever heard. <laughs> Gee, I'm off to I'm off to visit the Supreme Pontiff. Maybe I should get him something. What should I? What should I get? The fucking Supreme Pontiff and the heir to Saint Peter. No, fucking Undertale. <laughs> No, he gave him a he gave him a, he gave him a steam key for Undertale. Yeah, <laughs> for a steam key. He doesn't have. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. And he tried to justify it by saying, "Oh, it was a symbolic gesture." <laughs> Matt, it's just. I'm sorry. That's just interesting. Lame. What does it symbolize, Matt? It's just lame that he's what, that Matt Pat is lame. But yeah, so, back when I was watching Game Theory, I actually caught his two-parter on Mario. I think, like, still at that time, there was sort of a tongue-in-cheek element to his videos. Like, you weren't supposed to take these 100% seriously. Now he, like, insults you if you criticize him. No, I mean, like, for one thing, like, the whole crux of his, of his theory was that Mario was actually a psychopath, and it's like... Who in their right mind is gonna take that seriously? Somebody. Yeah, somebody. Yeah. yeah, it's the internet. Yeah, some people can't detect irony, but I do think back then he was still kind of in on the joke. Now he is the joke. <laughs> exactly. But what was kind of interesting was the second part where he kind of sort of dissected the Mario timeline, quote unquote. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Well, let me put it this way, he basically made the case that the Mario who ends up with Pauline and the Mario who ends up with Peach are not the same Mario. Yeah. The way I've always understood the Mario series, like, it, this kind of started mostly with all the Mar with the Mario Party stuff, but it's kind of been affirmed by 
basically every game that would have dialogue in the Mario series is that all the Mario characters are actors. Yeah. And they come together to do particular stories for the player's enjoyment. It's why every single Mario game is so vastly different from all the other ones. Because, well, they're just actors. It's why they can also get together to play golf and go for a round of tennis or do some go-kart racing. It's like the, on on stage they play their parts, but off the stage they just hang out and have fun. And which I'll, is why Bowser can just show up and hang out with them all the time. That makes so much sense, actually. Okay, you know the tired Wojak meme? Mama Luigi! I love that, just, no. Got a light? No. Are we, so I got a cool Are we Mario referencing Mario the old Mario Brothers show that had Captain Lou Albano? I mean, Mama Luigi is from the show, but the Got a Light No is from the Hotel Mario game. Both of those are delicious, classic YTP fodder. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. As same with the Zelda they CDI games. <laughs> <laughs> this dinner is what all true warriors strive for. Gee. It sure is boring out here. Do I know it's a funny thing yeah, about all those awful animations? They were done in Russia. Oh yeah, yeah, that part I've heard about. Yeah. Okay, so we got the Mario games, which have an easy way to explain all the different continuity discrepancies. But then you got Zelda, which actually is supposed to have a continuity. Yeah, that gets a little tougher to explain. <laughs> but, you know, the time break stuff, I mean, they do have the official explanation with the time break stuff I think with so. ocarina of time being the linchpin zelda might actually have the most convoluted voluted continuity i've seen in any fiction oh in a mark i yeah it's nowhere near close it's it's got two branches it ain't that bad there's way worse like kingdom hearts god marvel in general Basically, either of the mainline comic book continuities are way more convoluted than the Zelda timeline. Because all Zelda's got is, like, two... Maybe a third. Maybe. Yeah, but doesn't it kind of get kind of tricky figuring out which game places where? Alternate universes, reboot after reboot after reboot, that sometimes incorporates stuff from the earlier universe, sometimes doesn't. Zelda is way- is comparatively way more straightforward. Guys, look in my corner! <laughs> oh no... <laughs> Mamma mia... But yeah, Zelda has far from the most convoluted timeline. Of course, then you got uh, Metal Gear Solid, but that's a whole different- different episode. I mean, Kojima's just insane, so that, I, I just felt like that's a given. Like I said, that is, that is a discussion for another episode. My first Zelda game was, uh, it was also Wind Waker, my first mainline one. Then I, uh, accidentally borrowed permanently my friend's, uh, Oc GameCube Ocarina of Time. I very accidentally borrowed it permanently. <laughs> <laughs> like, I legitimately just forgot that I had it, and by the time we went to different schools, it just... Never got around to giving it back. Oh, shit. <laughs> but yeah, Wind Waker was my first one, and it kind of came out around the time I was still trying to be, like, I kind of got swept up by the, like, oh, good Vidru games have re-realistic graphics. And... Oh, God. It took me... I know, cringe. It was in the... And because of my age, it was in the Age of Brown. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. I disparage oh. that now, but, you know, everybody back then was caught up on, like, how realistic game graphics were, should be. In this because game. it was brown. HD, it's photo... Brown. HD, photorealism. Yeah, I'm kind of glad the Resident Evil 4 remake decided not to go with brown. No, no, it went with blue. Well, yeah, I thought it was fun, but it kind of took me a while to really come around to appreciating it, because it's only after it has time to age that you realize, oh, wow, this game actually ages really well. Yeah. Like, the fact that it didn't hyper-focus on 
photorealism on a engine with a limited capacity for it made it endure more because it has its own distinct style. It's knowing your limitations and making the best of them, for sure. And it's kind of something I was taught to keep in mind for all of my work, is to know my limitations and make the best of what I've got for a project. It's something that was drilled into me when I was uh, in the school for animation, because it was something that Pixar did a lot, because the reason they went with Toy Story is partially because, because they can they can animate people for the well yeah because the technology was too limited to make to render convince animated convincing human beings and the ones that ended up looking appealing looked really plastic so they're like okay they look kind of plastic so what if they were living toys and that's how you did it the first time it's also why they did fish for finding nemo is because well, for one, animating water or rendering water in 3D is a lot easier than people think it is. Yeah, but I remember seeing the behind-the-scenes documentary on Finding Nemo, where they said, like, people think that because fish don't have le arms or legs, and this makes them easier to animate, but no, it's not. Well, it's not that it makes it... It makes it easier to animate in the sense that there's less moving parts, but the moving parts are also a lot more subtle and it makes it harder to convey gestures with them because their limbs are a lot more limited. Well, that's kind of why they made the faces so expressive. Yeah, because the faces kind of have to carry most of the expression. Because they can't move their bodies around all that much. They, Their fins can only do so much for gesture. And they're going to be pretty locked into that form, especially when you're doing a 3D render. Mm -hmm. So... Technically, they're easier to animate, but they are also harder to... It's harder to get expressions out of them. It's easy to animate them as, like, background elements, but for character animation, it's a bit tougher. Yeah, I'm joining Sam and she, uh, she joined the Enclave from Fallout. Jesus Christ. <laughs> hey, didn't they, didn't, didn't they announce a new Metroid game? Uh, yeah, Metroid... Uh, Metroid... Prime 4. I'm actually surprised they're going back to the Prime series. I love the Prime series. Yeah, Metroid Prime 1 was that was my first Metroid game. Like, I love Metroid Prime. <laughs> I played the shit out of that, like, all the time. But yeah, got my Mario here. Mm -hmm. He's looking pretty cool. Yeah. So, I found an article by the BBC. Oh no. Alright. It says, how Donkey Kong became a trans icon. I don't want to hear any more beyond <sighs> that. Yeah, I mean, that basically says it all. I don't think you need to hear more after that. <laughs> I, <laughs> Just, I, I, want, I want to turn this into something into it. <laughs> oh, no. Listen, I'm fine with him just being Big Monkey. <laughs> big, big Monkey. Yes, he Big Monkey. He, he big monkey that wears a tie. Weirdly enough, like, one of my favorite games... One of my favorite Nintendo 64 games was uh, DK64. I keep seeing stuff that says, like, oh, DK64 is such a poorly designed game, and it's like... I mean, I guess in the technical sense, maybe it is, but... It, it's a lot of... It, it's really goofy, and it's a lot of fun, and... It's just, like... The one thing that I think I might agree on with how, like, weird its design is, is just the sheer amount of extraneous shit the characters can do, and the sheer amount of collectibles you'd have to that you can grab. There's almost too much to do in Donkey Kong 64. But, you know, I don't think that's a... I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, but you know, it's it may it may be fair to say that it's kind of over designed and over, it kind of an overloaded game with too much shit going on. And it's like it, it, that. I, I think that might be a fair criticism of it, but that, it's still a really fun game. What was that one Donkey Kong game that had the bongo controls and had a bunch of ads with Blink One Eighty Two in it? Is the rhythm in you?
play to the beat. Donkey Konga. I feel like that would have to be one of the Wii games. Fuck, what, no, I think it what was Donkey a, Kong game came on the Wii? A game, I think it was a GameCube game, actually. Hmm. I think it... I might be getting it wrong, but my br but my brain is defaulting to Donkey Konga or something. Donkey Kong Bongo controllers. Yeah, because that sounds like a kind of gimmick they would try on the Wii. No, I Jungle Beat. Jungle Beat, that was the I think that was the one. Like, I don't know for sure. Oh, it is GameCube. Huh. It's so weird because it sounds like I guess it might have been like their first foray into all the kind of weird gimmicky control mechanics they would have for the Wii later on. Oh my god, the one I was thinking of was was Donkey Konga. Was Donkey Kong was Don which what which console was Donkey Konga on? Uh GameCube. Oh Jesus. wait! It, oh, oh! Now I get it. It's not. It's a rhythm game. Yeah. How is it? I didn't not. How is it? I did not remember. It had all the small things on it. Oh, the small thing. No, I'm just kidding. Hey. Yeah, but this was in the this was in the Amer North American version because they had. Oh my God! It had like three different. Tr Rack listings, like one for the PAL region and one for J and another for Japan. Yeah, I drew Donkey Kong. He's uh, getting ready ready to join women's sports. <laughs> they put a Kylie Minogue song um, on on the North American version. Wow. <laughs> Oyo Oyo Koma Va by Santana. That's good. They put a Willie Nelson song on there. What the fuck? <laughs> Donkey Kong's gonna blaze it. <laughs> There's also Queen Devo the Romantics. Do you guys want to know what's on the uh, on the PAL version? What? They have Tito Puente, the Supremes, the Kingsmen, Christina Aguilera, Gemma Roquay. God, this is really showing its age. A different <laughs> Queen song from the North American version. The North American version has We Will Rock You. The PAL version has Don't Stop Me Now. 99 Red Balloons by Nina. Oh, they have two Jammy Real Quiet songs on there. Uh, I see you drawing Link. Monk. Which Link? Link. Oh, uh, is he drawing Toon Link? Yes. Oh, I was about to draw Toon Link, okay. That's all, uh... Alright, let's see. My first Zelda game was Twilight Princess. Midna yeah. is best companion. Change my mind. You can't. <laughs> I mean, look what her competition is. I'm gonna- I'm going to draw Midna. I mean, I- I also intend to do it. I guess I can fit in Midna and, uh, and maybe do some Pokemon stuff later. So, I have developed a new, uh, dumb, guilty pleasure genre of YouTube videos to watch. There's these, uh, videos of people playing Pokemon Showdown, which is basically like an online competitive Pokemon. There's these, uh, there's these compilations of this dude, like, taking down these hilariously toxic players who just spam a bunch of legendaries and beats them with shit like Magikarps and Shuckles and just humiliates them, and I find it hilarious. And they all act like Xbox 12Es from back when me and Brett would have been kids. And watching them just lose their shit is fucking hilarious. Yep, I decided I'm going to draw the, uh, uh, our favorite short stack, uh, Zelda waifu. Yes. <laughs> like I said, I mean, like, Midna being the best companion character in Zelda is not exactly much of a hurdle for her to clear, because look who she's up to. I mean... I get. I guess a lot of the handheld fans would disagree with you on that one, because uh, as I understand it, there's a lot of like really great companions in the handheld games. Yeah. <laughs> ah, so they're not all annoying like Navi. No. No. No, they're not. Navi is kind of just like Navi is kind of an. Well, I guess Navi and Fee are kind of on the same tier. I need to actually play every single Zelda game and just for the sake of doing a fucking Zelda companion <laughs> tier list. I don't think- Here we go. I don't think most people would argue against put making Navi F tier, though. Yeah, um, I suppose, yeah. Like, I, I'm always really reluctant 
to say that, or I guess I'm really reluctant to just jump, jump on kind of the normal takes, because it's like... I feel like somebody's gotta be worse. I'm drawing... I'm drawing uh, Midnight with the Stoon Dury face. <laughs> One of the things that I think aged really well with Wind Waker Link... Well, two things I think aged really well, besides like the graphics and the rendering, but in particular... I actually feel like the water, the way they handled water with their limitations is actually really good. Yeah, it still looks great. I, it's I still, th like, it's cartoony, but it still looks like water. I actually think uh, the original GameCube version looks better than the Wii U remaster. Yeah, I'm not a terribly big fan of the HD remaster. It looks a little bit... Bloom. Like, it glows a little too much, and it kind of loses a bit of the charm. <laughs> it, it, gl it glows so much, uh, it's made by the FBI. It's, uh, yeah, it's, um, it, it glows so much it might, uh, you know what, I'm not gonna finish that sentence, anyway. Yeah, although to get back on Zelda, it's kind of amazing, like, how many times they keep going back to the well of gain and being the good guy, but it never seems to get old. <laughs> I mean, being the bad guy. Well, yeah, because, like, part of the... Part of the narrative that they sort of cooked up with Zelda is that there's kind of a cyclical nature to their universe where eventually Gan the Ganon as like the force of evil kind of rises up again and he has to be- it's basically just straight up archetypal hero's journey but they give it a different setting and a different paint job every time and it works. Gamers rise up. <laughs> like I you know, like I said it you know, like I said it never gets rep it's never gotten stale or repetitive like and I guess part well, of the hero's was, journey has never been stale or repetitive <laughs> human beings keep coming back to it and I guess part of the part of so, it also comes down to the fact that they also sort of tweak the characters a little bit each time like, yeah they change they give it a different paint job they change it a little bit but it's still fundamentally the same story but you know yeah. like that. I mean, they change it just enough for the experience to be different every time. Yeah, like, Wind Waker is a very different experience from, say... It's very different from Twilight Princess, and very different from Ocarina of Time, it's very different from Link to Skyward the Past. Sword, or Link to the Past, or the original. Like, they're all very, very different from each other, and that's kind of to its credit. Even though they're fundamentally kind of the same story and the same premise, kind of surprised they're, they're doing, a, kind of surprised they're actually giving Link Breath of the Link. Wild a sequel, like like an actual. I mean, direct, I'm not like an actual direct sequel. I'm not terribly surprised by that because, as I understand it, Breath of the Wild is kind of what they wanted Zelda to be almost from the start. Yeah, they they just now have the technology to like do that. Yeah. The linear story was sort of a compromise for with their limitations and what people would buy. But now that they could do kind of a more open world, exploratory RPG kind of thing, they went ahead and did that. And it's kind of why they're running with Breath of the Wild. I think that's why they're running with Breath of the Wild. That and it was insanely popular. Oh, yeah. People yeah. liked it a lot. Oh yeah. It plays completely differently from almost every other Zelda game, but it's it's pretty popular. Oh well, yeah, it's got like RPG mechanics, it's got survival mechanics, it's kind of got a little bit of everything. And uh, I've only I've only actually played a little bit of Breath of the Wild. I, most of my exposure to it was watching one of my old girlfriends play it. Here's a so here's a Toon Link reaction image for you. No need to ha I love how expressive Toon Link is. He is yes. easily... He, I mean, I guess that's by nature of him being like a cartoon character, but he's easily the most expressive of the Links. He's, if I had to pick like a favorite Link, Wind Waker Link is probably my favorite. Here, now I'm drawing uh, the curvy part of Minna. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Little tiny calves, but huge thighs. <laughs> They designed her like this on purpose. Of course. <laughs> Listen, if you're gonna have to be looking at somebody's backside the entire time, what up up and up up? Not finishing that sentence. <laughs> that was actually kind of a 
let down by Midna's true form. Oh, yeah, I, I remember liking it a lot. She should have been thicker. I mean, listen, we can't have everything we wish for. <laughs> I don't know, I just kind of really liked, I kind of liked her as a tiny little gremlin. Yeah, uh, so do uh, most people, just, uh, <laughs> if, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I'll try something else before I go, because I don't think I've shown uh, Mario's enough love. Mario's. Okay, mm. so, guessing oh. that's Luigi. Anybody here, anybody here play the Paper Mario games? Yes. I missed out okay. on them. Okay, so, um... Paper Mario is the first Paper Mario game is probably one of my favorite Nintendo games ever. So for if you haven't played it, Brett, um, Paper Mario yeah. is basically the first two Paper Mario games are basically straight up like Mario RPG with a different aesthetic veneer. And uh, one of the things, and uh, you might find this interesting if you ever want to grab it on an emulator or something, is that uh. The first part of Paper Mario involves Bowser actually like like stealing the castle, kind of like how he does in uh, Mario Galaxy, if I remember right. Like he has an underground fortress, lift the castle into the sky, and it has Mario try to fight him, and then Mario gets his ass kicked. Like the first battle is Bowser completely trouncing you. And then throwing Mario back down to Earth, and you basically have to start from there. It's, uh, I think it really stands out because it's one of the... It's the first time we got the impression that Bowser is genuinely threatening outside of, like, the older games. Although, uh, Mar Super Mario 64 had him pretty damn threatening, too. Although, mostly through atmosphere. Once you boop him on the spikes three times, he kind of loses his punch. Ah, oh, you're drawing one of the boos. Yeah, I'm drawing Bo specifically. She's one of the uh, she's one of the companion characters, and she's like great. She's like a big Ojo Sama. Remember when the Super Crown was kind of a trend on Twitter for a while? The what? Oh yeah, 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 for Bowsette and shit. No oh, guy. <laughs> yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong on the history of this little trend, but that didn't start out as being like an official Nintendo thing, like, that was just somebody's fan art that just... Yeah, it was part of yeah. a meme. It was, it was just fan art, yeah. Yeah, it was just somebody's fan art that ended up taking on a life of its own. Yeah, I mean, that's how a lot of these things happen. I've never drawn Bowsette even when she was, like, trending and popular. I mean, I was always intimidated. I never thought I could actually do it well enough to do her justice. Yeah, this was back during a time where I couldn't do anatomy to, like, if I tried to, I couldn't do anatomy, and it would have just turned out just cringe. Yeah, Bowser got some, uh, shall we say, interesting designs. <laughs> Two big interesting designs. Yes. Well, her and Booette. So does liking Bowser make you gay, because it's technically Bowser? I don't want to um, think. I don't want to think too hard about it personally. I guess to bring it back to ghosts and Mario, everyone kind of agrees Luigi's Mansion is extremely underrated, right? I love Luigi's Mansion, especially the first game. <laughs> I think I, I think everybody was kind of surprised that it got a sequel. Yeah, not only that, it's, it has a third installment. <laughs> yeah, there's a third one. Really? So it's yeah, yeah, there is. Like I said, it's just I like... I mean, admitted one of my primary exposure to it was watching Gura play it, but yeah, it exists. There is a third one. It's pretty high. As far yeah. as I could tell. I mean, that's pretty awesome, though, because, like, it had just... For the longest time, it was just, like, this like this forgotten gem that Nintendo you know, put out on the GameCube. Yeah, well, it was also the GameCube's launch title. Really? Yep. Yeah, it was the first game there. Wow. So it wasn't exactly, like, snuck under the radar. It was f almost front and center. Yeah, but it was, like, for years when any time I heard people talk about Luigi's Mansion, like, everyone always said, oh, it's so underrated. I think it only got so un... People only thought of it as so underrated because it kind of got overshadowed by the other, like, big Mario title that came out afterwards. It kind of got overshadowed by Sunshine later. 
Could could you say it blew sunshine in its ass? Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I really love Sunshine. I actually still go back to play it every so often. Same here. Yeah, people give Sunshine like shit, but it's like I genuinely like love that game. Oh yeah, it's I I, I really like it. Like one of the things that sort of conceptually that I really like about it, as far as game design goes, is that it basically like if you had Sunshine's powers in a previous Mario game, it would make it ridiculously easy. But Sunshine was really good at, like, adapting the game to the new advantage that you have with, like, the hover, the hover nozzle and the rocket jump and shit. It was very good about giving you a new advantage and then forcing you to actually use it and then having little levels where... Where you don't have it. Yeah, where you don't have it and you have to prove that you're a true gamer. <laughs> You have to prove that you're a real gamer and actually platform without its help. So yeah, it's, it's I, I think Sunshine was a really good title for what it was. Like, I guess there are some things about it that might be kind of jank, but... I don't know, it, it's still a really fun game. I like it a lot. The fact Nintendo has not made Bowsette official might be a blessing in disguise. Give it time. N no, they've had to go out of their way and say, no. No, th this this is not can canonically possible. <laughs> you heard it. You heard it. They said nope. This that is not canon. It is just horny fan art. Yes. Good. Hey, here you go. I, More. I, I, I drew Bowsett. That's God. I'm seeing all this like really good bow fan art in my image search, and now I just feel kind of bad. Let me move on to something else. Star Fox. Oh shit, there's an idea. I'm going to draw, uh, what's your name, Crystal. Oh, you know I'm what? I'm not a furry. Boy. But... <laughs> Rouge, and what? Rouge and Crystal, the two go-to furry characters for thirsty guys who are not furries, or at least claim to be. Claim not to be. Alright, you know what? I'm going to, because it has not been broached yet, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some Pokemon stuff. I think my first exposure to Pokemon was the anime. Yeah! I, I don't think I've ever actually played any of the games. I've played basically all of them up till Sun and Moon. And I actually tried my hand at doing competitive for a little bit. Uh, my first Pokemon game was, uh, that one with Pikachu, um, on a Nintendo 64 where you, like, talked to him or... Something. Oh, hey you, Pikachu? <laughs> yes, that was my first I Pokemon. apologize. I apologize for that being your first exposure to Pokemon. Because that game was broke as shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. when I, when I brought it over to play it with my cousin, he'd basically just, like, say swear words at Pikachu because that's about all you could do. The game was ridiculously non-functional. I think I remember having a poster, though, for one of the games. I think it was for... <sighs> I'm trying to remember. Which gen was it? It was early 2000s. It was the... And it was the one that introduced Groudon as the legendary... That's Gen 3. Gen th yeah, I'm trying to remember. That's Ruby and Sapphire. There we go. Yeah, that was the it one. If it was Groudon specifically, it would have been Ruby. Yeah, I think it was a poster I got out of a magazine, and it was like reversible, like it had a Ruby side and a Sapphire side. So, uh, so I'm looking at uh, Crystal's uh, design. Uh, I forgot she totally had like a tramp stamp on the back, like a tribal looking tramp stamp. Well, the thing is, Crystal was originally supposed to be in a game that wasn't supposed to be a Star Fox game. I know, god damn it. Dinosaur Planet. Yeah. Yeah, Rare was originally developing a different game called Dinosaur Planet. Once Nintendo got in the mix, they decided, why don't you take this game you're making and make it a Star Fox game instead? I mean, guess it's got a fox in it. I suppose we could do it. The vibe I have of Star Fox Adventure is that it isn't a bad game. 
but it's not what people want out of a Star Fox game. No, oh, yeah, I don't. Would think... you believe me if I said that was my first Star Fox game? Yeah, at this point, I would. <laughs> Your first Pokemon <laughs> game was Hey You Pikachu. It kind of checks out, and really tepid take. No Star Fox game is going to outdo 64. You don't hear fucking music, do you? <laughs> Not this time. Not this time. Jesus fucking Christ. We had to read. We kind of had to redo that take at least three times because. Don't say it, Christ. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We're exposing you for for your autism moment. Oh Christ! I think I saw Razor Fists. This retrospective on the Star Fox series. And once he got to Star Fox Adventure, like, he's, that's more or less what he said. Like, it's not a bad game. But the only thing he really got salty about it over was that Crystal replaced Peppy on the team. Uh, oh, 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 the old, uh, rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> when he said Pepe, for some reason, yeah, I, I didn't thought... Say, of... I didn't say Pepe, I said Peppy. That's his name. I know, I know, I, th I thought you said... No, I meant, I thought you said Pepe, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> No, they don't have a. They do not have a frog uh, character. Wait, they do yes, have a. No, they, not a frog. He's not a frog. He's a toad. I think. Oh. Oh wow. Real. Thanks for clearing that up. Real big distinction. Wow. Thanks, Brett. <laughs> there is a fucking god. There is a difference between. There is a difference between frogs and toads. Yeah. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Frogs are. It's a green. It's a green thing with a round mouth that's got eyes bulging out. Fro frogs are. Frogs have really moist skin and hang around water a lot. Toads have really have drier, wartier skin. Have you met Slippy? That shit is moist. <laughs> moist. Okay. I'm gonna draw like the the little panels they show up in uh, Star Fox. Right. I remember that being like really cool when I was a kid. I'm kind of amazed that it's it taken me this long to point out that Nebel's been drawing Hex Maniac. <laughs> That's right. Is that literally what her name is? It's a trainer class. They will have names afterwards. So it would be Hex Maniac Chelsea or Hex Maniac. Uh, you know what? Let me look up what their names were. So it's not just a single character? No, it's a trainer class. There's a bunch of hex maniacs, just like there's a bunch of young there's a bunch of youngsters and there's a bunch of hikers. They first appeared in the third gen, but the design that we know and love is from X and Y. Uh, the ones in X which is Gen 6. So the X the Hex Maniacs there are Anina, Arachna, Carrie, Desdemona, Josette, Luna, Melanie, Osana, and Razia. All of whom sound like people I dated at one point. Hmm, correct me if I'm wrong, but like the characters that will that tend to appear in the games don't always appear in the anime, right? Not always, no. The trainer classes, if they do appear in the anime, they're usually like... It would usually just be one person, and even then, they wouldn't necessarily like reflect the design in the games. As far as I can tell, Hex Maniac has only appeared in the manga and the games. So there's no anime Hex Maniac, as far as I know. I mean, like, for one, as far as I know, Ash is an anime original character. Sort yeah. of? He's kind, kind of, of a... He's kind of an export of the Red... He's kind of an export of Red, but adapted for an anime format. He's, he's basically red and also the yellow protagonist. Like, the yellow protagonist is pretty definitively Ash. At least I think so, anyway. There, yeah, look at you, Slippy. <laughs> Hopefully on. this Slippy is a little more useful than the actual Slippy. Like, I don't think I know anyone who actually likes Slippy. <laughs> I actually kind of- I was kind of okay with him. I didn't find him nearly as- Like, it was only when he got kidnapped that I got kind of annoyed with him. Otherwise, he performed about as well as everybody else on the team. I mean, why do you have Slippy when you've got Falco and Peppy? You need a third wingman. I'll be your wingman anytime. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I want to draw that where it's like Fox and Falco. They're like, <laughs> that scene. Okay, so which one of them gets the shades? Here, I'm gonna try my hand at a Pokemon trainer. Okay. <laughs> Is it Cynthia? No. Oh, 
it looks like B actually made it into the anime. Well, yeah, she's a she's a gym leader, isn't she? So yeah, she I guess she would have to. Some of the way she moves, I don't know why, but it makes me think of Toph from Avatar. Well, it kind of makes sense. She she uh, isn't she like a rock type trainer? I thought she was a fighting type trainer. Oh yeah, she looks oh, like. Fighting I mean, either kind of makes sense. It's B E A. Yeah, B like B Arthur. Gelar Karate Pro. Yep, yep, fighting type. Okay. But she's dressed like an MMA fighter, so yeah, kind of checks out. <laughs> okay. If this if this Pokemon series has been dubbed and it's not Jenny Flower doing her voice, I'm gonna be disappointed. So uh, I guess I have an answer for favorite gym leader from Dylan. Yeah. Although if it's <laughs> different from B, I would like to hear it. No, no. Oh god, it's not Jenny Flower. I am disappointed. So, is it B, Dylan? Is your favorite just B? Yeah, I would say she's my favorite. And yes, it is because how she looks, yes. <laughs> okay, how about favorite Elite Four? I mean, I only ask because I have a favorite Elite Four character. Let's see, my favorite Elite Four... I don't know any of these people. Oh, okay. Uh, you don't okay, know. See, see, I don't really keep up with Pokemon. I just, I just see, like, certain trainers, and I'm like, yes. <laughs> Man, I've got the big autism energy today. Does I even have a favorite Elite Four trainer? I might draw her next. Okay, I'm I'm probably uh, gonna be completely wrong with this take, but yeah, as far as that. as far as I'm aware, Pokemon doesn't have a single bad entry in it. Um, hmm. That's where you're gonna get a lot of controversy because a bunch of people have a bunch of takes on like which one is worse or whether it's bad now. It's um, it's a hotly contested topic, let's say. One, whether there's a bad Pokemon game, and two, which one it is. I guess Hey You Pikachu is pretty indisputably bad because it's a barely functional game. But yeah. as for the others, are like the mainline games, it's kind of, like I said, it's controversial. Like, people get into arguments over which one is the worst. Like, one of the games I dislike the most is actually pretty controversial. Which one? Oh no, I might, I might get us in trouble. I might get, uh, I might get us demonetized. Demonetized. <laughs> that matters. Demonetized over an, over an opinion on a Pokemon game? Wow. You have heard of dumber things. <laughs> there have okay. been dumber things. Okay, hit us, hit us. Alright, alright. Pokemon Hot Tank. Gen 4 is not that good. Oh boy. <laughs> Elaborate. Okay. Gen 4's plot, they get their pants scrunched up in a tizzy over fucking Cyrus wanting to achieve godhood and the fact that, like, the legendary Pokemon involved are, like, god tier. But you separate it from those kinds of superficial elements and Cyrus is kind of a boring antagonist. He's basically like Diet Pokemon Sephiroth, and a lot of the designs for the Pokemon in Diamond and Pearl that I ended up liking were Pokemon designs that were based on Gen 2 Pokes. So there are very few like original Gen 4 Pokemon designs that I actually like, and Gen 4 is so bogged down by the sheer amount of HMs that it's required to use to get through it, that the game becomes unnecessarily slow paced, and I honestly can't remember a single gym leader or a single Elite Four member in the Gen 4 games. The only person I remember is Cynthia, and that's because there's like fuck tons of porn of her. And here's another hot take that would get me in even more trouble. Gen 5 is better than Gen 4. Oh no. <laughs> Gen 5 has a far better villain plot with far more interesting antagonists and Gen 5, and this is the point that I will grant, is one of the things that will make you love it or hate it. Gen 5 feels like a completely different place from all the other generations. It's meant to be a fresh start because your first playthrough, before you go through like post-game content, you do not encounter a single Pokemon from the previous generations. Not one. And that's the point. It's supposed to be an entirely different region. And yeah. 
overall, it has a far more interesting experience than Gen 4, and as controversial of a take it is, I think it, of the Pokemon games that I have played, it is my second favorite. My first favorite being, I mean, it's less controversial, but I'm sure some people might get a little upset. My first favorite being Gen 2. Nice. Gen 1 or BTFO. Gen 2 <laughs> is gold and silver, right? Yeah. We're, we're up to Gen 9, Jesus. Yep. I kind of want to try to catch up on the Pokemon games. Although that would require me getting a Switch or a, a Switch emulator. Wink, wink. I don't think it's much of a stretch yeah. to say that if Maeve was into Pokemon, she would be a ghost main. <laughs> she would what? Maeve would be a ghost fairy main. Oh, that'd be cool. Cool idea. Like, like, uh, job Maeve as a Pokemon trainer. What type would Brittany main? Uh, well, she. I don't know. If she would main a type. You know what? Just for the lols, I think Brittany would just have an entire team of unknown that spelled something silly. Unknown are psychic types, aren't they? Yes, they are. But that wouldn't be why she did it. She would do it because it's funny to spell swear words with unknown on your team. Alright, I think that does it for Hex Maniac here. Now, you, know, I you know, I love that the Pokemon anime established that Meowth taught himself how to walk and talk. Mostly just so you could impress another a female Meowth. I have learned the secrets of language. Here's the thing though, if Meowth could teach himself that, why don't other Pokemon? Because it's not really worth it for them. Sheer will and determination. <laughs> like, I assume they probably could, it's just most of them don't. They have no reason to. So, what exactly is that thing on Meowth's head? Is that like a... It's a coin. coin. Yeah, yeah. And he actually would make those if he uses Payday, although I don't think the, uh... He I don't think the anime Meowth ever does. He doesn't do any... about the most he'll use is his claws. Yeah. Otherwise, he's just there to be another part of... part of the Team Rocket trio. He's kind of a... he's another goon. Uh, he's a little goober. No, he's just like... he's part of that classic... of that anime trope where they have, like, a trio of villains who are just come of relief. And the goofy animal one. So, last thing, uh, the Karen quote that I absolutely like, that I absolutely love, from when you beat her in the Elite Four. Uh, Strong Pokemon, weak Pokemon. These are the perceptions of selfish people. A truly skilled trainer wins with their favorites. <laughs> 